Hi, thanks, Karen. And thank you for inviting me to speak at your community weekend. Uh, so as Karen said, I work for Genetic Alliance UK and Alex TLC approached us to do a study related to newborn screening. What I'm going to talk about this morning is a little bit of background, go over the methods that we use, the sample, the results from the study, and then some recommendations that we came up with at the end of the study. So as you've just heard, we know that there's currently no UK newborn screening programme, but other countries are introducing it. What we wanted to understand for this study was the views of men who had been diagnosed as adults as I, uh, with either AM, N or ALD. And we wanted to know what they thought about knowing sooner that they had had that diagnosis, so from birth, that they were not diagnosed until adulthood. And also then what their attitudes generally were towards newborn screening. So we started with a literature review to find out what work had already been done. And at the moment, there, there isn't a lot out there on XALD. So we did look a little bit more widely to see what other studies had looked at, newborn screening and perspectives for other rare conditions. We did interviews with men who'd been diagnosed with AMN or ALD. And then we did a broader online survey with a, a wider sample which included carers and family members. So the topic guide for the interview study was developed based on the literature review that I'd done. And then the survey was designed based on the findings from the interview study and the literature and of course discussions with staff from Alex TLC. So there were four interviews done by telephone about a year ago. All the interviews were um, recorded and then transcribed verbatim, which means they were uh, written word for word so that I can then use quotes from those studies. These have been anonymized, but these are the words that were used by the people during the interview. So all these men had been diagnosed as adults as a result of first experiencing symptoms. Three of the four men had children. Two of them had had their children before they'd had their diagnosis. One of them had children after having their diagnosis. Now all these men had experienced a range of tests in order to establish the diagnosis, with many of them going through misdiagnosis along the way to get their final diagnosis as is not uncommon for many rare conditions. Not all of the men had then had their mothers tested, but some of them had, and those that had, the mothers were found to be carriers. The respondents of the four interviewees used a variety of mobility aids, so some were in wheelchairs, some used walking sticks. There was also a variety of the impact on their working lives, so some of them have had to stop work, or perhaps they'd moved on to a different position in the work that they did have. All of the men uh, consented to take part in the interview. So the survey that happened a couple of months later, there was 29 respondents, 21 of them completed the survey totally, and eight of them completed it partially but we did include their results because we did find that that was important to have their point of view, even if they didn't quite manage to get through to the end of the survey. All the people who answered the survey had to be based in the UK and over 16 years of age. And the eligible groups were that they either themselves had to be male over 16 with ALD or AMN, or they had to be a current family member or carer of a male over 16, or a previous carer of a male over 16. So for the survey, the age at diagnosis varied between birth and age 50, and the length of time to diagnosis varied between months then and years. And again, there was a variety in the level of experiences of the people who answered the survey. So they talked about different levels of experience in terms of their fatigue, memory loss, 
problems with concentration or their symptom severity. And again, they used a, a variety of mobility aids and a, also, same as the interviewees, some of them had experienced misdiagnoses along the way to get their final diagnosis. So just going on to the results now. So I've broken this down into three themes. So the first theme is about knowing and not knowing and the balance that is involved in that. Also looking then, secondly, at the benefits and risks of screening, and then a little bit about the availability the, or the attitudes towards the availability of screening for XLD in the UK. So if we start with the knowing and not knowing. So the graph on the left is for people who had de identified themselves as a previous carer. So the person with AMN or ALD was no longer alive. And of those, there was five of those, uh, those four of them said they would have wanted that person to know earlier, as in from birth, that they had the condition that they were then diagnosed with as an adult. One of them said that they wouldn't have wanted that person to know. So the graph on the right shows for the 15, either parents, carers, or men themselves who answered the survey, whether they would have wanted to know, and there, all of them said they did want to know. So if we just look at the person who said that they didn't want that person to know. So the reason they gave was, and they, this is their words, because he was able to live a mostly happy life, and I wonder how it would have felt for him to live with the knowledge that his life was going to be cut short. Now, when we looked at the interviewees of the four people I interviewed, there was a lot of balancing of arguments going on, not surprisingly. It's not necessarily a clear-cut thing. And of the four, one of them indicated that they perhaps would not have wanted to know, while the other three indicated they would have wanted to know uh, sooner. So for the person who wouldn't have wanted to know, what they said was, so I lived for a number of years blissfully ignorant. Is there something to be said for that? Maybe there is. I think I probably had a better quality of life. I think having lived for so many years without knowing a single thing about it, I don't think it done me any harm. At no point in the number of years was I anticipating a disease coming and that might be considered to be a good thing. The other side of the balance was this idea that knowledge is power. And here we see a slightly different perspective. So here are the quotes from two of the interviewees. So one says, it's knowledge is power in terms of knowing what to expect. I think I'd probably come down on the side I would want to know, or certainly as a parent, I'd want to know. Another interviewee said, yeah, it's again, do you want to know, but with knowing it's everything else that goes with it. Difficult one. But then again, part of me thinks to myself, well, knowledge is power. Another interviewee identified that it's about being prepared. I think if I'd known about it, I would have had things in place, you know? 100%. It would have been totally different. Yeah. So the next area that we talked about was about benefits and risks. And there were some sub-themes in this area. So it was things to do with the disease course, about knowledge, again, healthcare and costs, and then that idea of balancing the benefits versus the risks. So if we start with the disease course, and of course many of these things don't just affect the, affect the individual, they affect the family as well. And the benefits that they were highlighted, and there were many, was about the increased chances for someone treated early to reach their potential, that there would be an improved quality of life, that they would have access to benefits and support far sooner if they had an earlier diagnosis, and also there'd be an impact on accessing education. There'd also be that reduced length of time to the diagnostic odyssey, and this again can very much impact the whole family. And it can avoid that issue where people are either told that there's nothing wrong or that it's all in their head, 
or they get maybe a completely di different diagnosis and maybe go down a different path for a while before they get their final correct diagnosis. So if we look at some of the quotes that relate to this, so anything that is in a quote bubble was from the interviewee, so from those four. Anything that's in a square box was from the survey where people had the opportunity to type in sort of open-ended comments. So thinking about the diagnostic odyssey, one of the interviewees says, there's that as well, that unknown. I mean, that was, yeah, a pretty low time those few months. Well, probably longer than that. So one of the respondents from the survey said, my brother was misdiagnosed on several occasions, which resulted in my mum not being believed or understood by healthcare professionals. This was a very scary and difficult time for the family. If we think about some other benefits about the disease course, this is clearly highlighted in, in earlier discussions about the ability to monitor and then receive timely treatment before symptoms arise. And also there's that potential to have an earlier diagnosis of adrenal insufficiency, which can then also be treated. So again, some quotes just to support that. So, if they get ill or any problems, then at least you know what to look for. There would have been a possibility of treatment. I just know that if my brother had been diagnosed with ALD at birth, like myself, then there's a much greater chance he might still be with us now. Now, there were, of course, also risks mentioned. And if we think about medical intervention, we think about false positives, and this was mentioned in the previous talk that there actually weren't any false positives in their pilot study, which is obviously a good thing. But there can be false positives, and that can lead to anxiety about the results. It also might lead to a potential overtreatment of an infant who does not have the condition or over-investigation or what's termed as a sort of potential over-medicalisation of the infant or the child early on. So what one of the interviewees said was, talking about false positives, that is a risk and that would be really negative, especially at that time when it should be the happiest moment in your life, when you have your children and it turned out to be false, you know? Have a false positive, that would really put a cloud over it, potentially. So if we now move on to the theme of knowledge and we think about the benefits that were highlighted from both the interviewees and the respondents in the survey, it was that knowledge to be able to prepare for the child's condition or to be able to at least make the most of the time that you had with the child. Importantly, it was about reproductive decisions and that would be for the parents who'd had the child who'd had the diagnosis, for perhaps later in life, that child themselves, and for other family members. Knowledge could also maybe influence lifestyle choices. And it was the avoidance of knowing that you had a condition that could have been perhaps diagnosed earlier, that wasn't. And again, some quotes to support that, so from the interviewees, 100% my thoughts, it's needed. No doubt about it. Stop it spreading on. You carry the gene, and you, if you have children, you can pass it on. Another interviewee. I think if parents were told from day one, they'd be able to put things in place and have a full, undisclosed knowledge and everything else. And then one of the survey respondents. I think if you are aware of your child having this condition, you're more prepared for the challenges. But of course, there's also risks that come with knowledge. When you have knowledge, you have to inform other members of the family and friends. And that can lead to tension, that can lead to difficulties described by some of the interviewees. There's also this idea of a perceived child vulnerability before the symptoms arise. And then the patient in waiting that was mentioned by the, the previous speaker is that being in that liminal state between health and sickness, and then being continually alert for symptoms, and that might be described as the burden of knowledge. And also, of course, there is then an anxiety or grief for the sort of anticipation that this child will not reach their potential. So some of the 
uh, quotes that went alongside this theme. I think, you know, knowing is a great thing from day one, but a parent's going to start then wrapping everything up in bubble wrap and not allowing them to do certain things because of that knowledge, and it then stifles the child in terms of its creativity, its independence. And one of the survey respondents said, risks about acceptance of child, medicalization of normal childhood concerns, impact on physical and mental well-being of the child. Now, if we think of the third theme, which is to do with the sort of societal costs, and we think first about the healthcare system and some of the benefits that were described, there will be less burden on the healthcare system if someone is diagnosed through newborn screening because there's far less intervention than needed. There's also the possibility of raising awareness amongst healthcare professionals and the public if it's part of the newborn screening program. And there's an increased medical knowledge about the natural history of the condition and more opportunities to do research from birth because we can understand better about the disease course. So some supporting quotes. There is so much research going on which screening would push forward undoubtedly. I feel excited about, and they're talking about screening being available in other countries here, it's a good move to facilitate development in the medical field. We've also got some risks then that are associated with the healthcare system, that if there's an inaccurate result, it might lead to a lowered trust in the medical system, and then there's the whole ethics about storing medical uh, information, which we won't go into. So one of the uh, quotes was, if you're being over-treated for something and it comes back nothing at all, and you're exposing a very young baby or a very young child to a lot of tests that come out with nothing, then you've got the worry that you know, parents are going to get very upset. They've had to put their child through all of this on the advice of medical professionals. So other benefits about costs are going to relate very much to other areas of life. So that's to do with support system and education and so on. But there's also the other side that has to be included. If a parent has to give up work and therefore isn't earning money or contributing through the tax system, that is a cost as well that has to be included. These quotes cover that. I'm going to skip them because I'm running slightly short of time. Um, though some, one of the risks is that there is a cost of the uh, screening program, and if the cost is going on that, it can't go on to something else because there's not an infinite amount of money, as this person said. Equally, you do have to understand it from a sort of cost point of view as well. You know, the NHS has only got a finite amount of money, and all these things cost money, don't they? So I'm not expecting you to read any of these, but on a balance, if you can see, these are all the different areas, and you see the benefits on the left and the risks on the right. And so in terms of numbers of risks, uh, of benefits, sorry, there does seem to be more. What we actually did in the survey, we asked people to rank in terms of importance from one to 10, 15 benefits and uh, 12, 13 risks. And what we found was all the benefits ranked between 9.36 and 10 out of 10, with the most important one being the increased chances of an individual who's treated early to be able to fulfill work, family, or life potential. Of the 12 risks, their scores were between 3.27 and 6.26 in terms of importance, so they did have lower levels of importance, with the most important risk being this patient in waiting, so that potential anxiety caused by continually being on the alert for the condition arising. But you can see there are very strong feelings, and when we did ask people to balance from the survey, all 21 people said that they felt strongly that the benefits outweighed the risks. And there were several quotes that then supported this idea of it being a balance, but the benefits outweighing the risks. When we asked um, for whether boys should be screened and whether girls should be screened, we did see that for boys, everyone who answered that question, they all felt they should be screened. For girls, there were a few that were unsure or who preferred not to answer that question. If we asked people about for their own children, whether they'd want them to be screened, of those who had children, 14 out of 15 said they would, and one gave another answer. 
So in terms of the recommendations that we have from the study, there is not enough literature out there, and there's not enough research. We do need to understand more. We also need to understand from a broader perspective of people. So we need to understand from uh, women who are carriers, from family members, perhaps family members who've decided not to be screened after a member of their family was tested positive, understand what their reasoning might be for wanting to not know. We need to understand about this balance. What is it that people are having to think and balance between the benefits and the risks and the knowing and not knowing? We also, of course, need bigger samples. This is quite a small study that we did. We need a broader sample that goes beyond people who are related to the, the charity. Obviously, they're the most engaged people. They want to take part, and that's fantastic. We need to hear broader points of view. So I'm just going to... Um, I know we're doing questions at the end. So my main thing was that I wanted to say thank you, obviously, to all the respondents uh, who answered the survey, and especially the interviewees. Um, and thank you for inviting me today to speak. Thank you.